Whakatakate hau ki te uru, whakatakate hau ki te tonga, ki a mākina ki na ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai. E hiake ana te atākura, he tio, he hoka, he hauhu, tihei mauri ora. Mauri ora ki te whai au ki te au mārama, e rauranga tirama. Nau mai, piki mai, kake mai, haere mai. Thank you all for coming to the lawn for these two reports. Acting now for violence and abuse free future. Fakamahia te tukino kore inaya nei, a muriake nei. And fakamanahia te treaty, fakahau marutia te tangata. Honor the treaty, protect the person. I would like to welcome our four speakers who will be appearing in this order Disability Rights Commissioner Paula Tesoriero, Ruth Jones, co director of Kanohiki Te Kanohi and a member of the Commission's reference group for the two reports. Dr. Debbie Hager, researcher and author of the report Acting Now for Violence and Abuse Free Future. And finally, we are delighted that the Minister for the, for the Prevention of Family and Sexual Violence, Honourable Marama Davidson, is also joining us. We have allowed time for questions at the end. We will be running to a tight timetable due, due to our speakers' commitments and hope to be finished by one o'clock. Here's a few housekeeping rules. You can submit questions at any time on the Slido platform. Look to the right of your screen. They will be moderated and sent through to the panel. Um, if you are watching via Facebook Live, you will notice a QR code on the top right-hand corner. Scan that and it will take you to the Slido where you can ask a question. Okay, I would now like to welcome Paula Tesoriero to speak about why the Commission asked for these reports to be done. Kia ora, Paula. I ngā mana, i ngā reo rauru ngā tira mā, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Paula Tesoriero toko ingoa. Ko o te kaihutu, tika hoatanga mō te kāhui, tika tangataka ki Aotearoa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Mauri tangata, Mauri ora. A very warm welcome to everybody present for today's launch of two very important reports. Whakamahia te tū kino kore in INA, a muri ake nei, acting now for a violence and abuse free future. And whakamanahia te tiriti, whakahau marutia te tangata. Honour the treaty, protect the person. These two reports are the outcome of a collective effort. I want to first extend my heartfelt thanks to all those who contributed to these reports. Firstly, to Dr. Debbie Hagar, researcher and author of the report, Acting Now for a Violence and Abuse-Free Future. I also want to acknowledge lead author of the Tangata Whenua report, Georgia Callahan, with input from Ruth Jones, QSM, and Chrissy Cowan. I want to acknowledge the members of the Disability Sector Reference Group, Paul Brown, Ruth Jones, Sue Hobbs, Associate Professor Patsy Frawley, Dr. Huhana Hickey, Leo McIntyre, Gay Richards, Gary Williams, Robin Hunt, and Associate Professor Bridget Mervyn Beach. And I want to thank the team here at the Human Rights Commission for all the input, long hours, and work that's gone into bringing today about. And I look forward to being part of a discussion with Ruth Jones, Dr. Debbie Hagar, and the Honourable Marama Davidson. The Human Rights Commission has worked with a reference group of disabled people and allies in the development of the report, Acting Now for a Violence-Free Future including to broker engagement between disabled people and the joint venture on family violence and sexual violence. And Tangata Whenua have led the development of our Tangata Whenua report. Violence is a problem of national significance in Aotearoa. We know the stats about the rate of family violence and sexual violence across our country. 35% of women in New Zealand have experienced physical and or sexual intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Violence against disabled people and tangata whaikaha Māori 
have been hiding in plain sight in Aotearoa for too long. We don't talk about it. We don't acknowledge it. We certainly haven't responded to it. Sometimes we haven't believed it. Or worse, worse than not believing it, we've somehow accepted that this just might be the existence for the lives of many disabled people and therefore we have silenced it. We haven't heard about the violence and abuse experienced by disabled women, men and children in Tangata Whai Kaha Māori on a daily basis throughout New Zealand. The violence perpetrated against disabled people are among the most disadvantaged and marginalised groups in our society, and it has been invisible for too long. I acknowledge the pain and the harm done to those who have experienced violence and abuse. We can't stand by any longer and allow their intrinsic dignity and human rights to be violated. A key step is to recognise the magnitude of the violence affecting disabled people in Tangata Whaikaha Māori. Conservatively, that magnitude is estimated as twice the overall rate compared to non-disabled people, increasing to between four and five times the rate for disabled women and children. I commissioned these two reports to collate all of the evidence available on the violence and abuse that disabled people in Tangata Whaikaha Māori experience. They don't just bring the evidence together, they offer a te tariti and human rights roadmap to address these serious issues. My hope is that these reports bring greater awareness of the magnitude of these issues and ignites action for a violence and abuse-free Aotearoa New Zealand. We can't procrastinate on these issues anymore. I'm going to hand back to Hemi in a moment and I'll come back later to walk through the key issues and recommendations. Thank you, Hemi. Kia ora, thank you, Paula. Now I'd like to welcome Ruth Jones, who has been an integral part of the reference group who helped guide us as we researched and collated the information in these two reports. Ruth is going to speak especially to the experiences of Tāngata Whaikaha Māori. Kia koe te wā, Ruth. Ha, kia ora koutou. Ngā mihi nui ki a koutou e ngā whānau. Ngā mihi hoki a hau ki te kaupapa o tēnei rā. Uh, ko wai au, ngā pai maunga e kariputi nei, ko puke mai rea ko mana waru. Ngā wai e karepune ko waiapu ko arai te uru. E hoia ai, mā ronga waka, ko harauta, ko takitimu, ko rāhoi, ko mani tuki ngā marai e tūnei. Tēnei a ngā tiparau e ronga whakata e ofa atu nei ki a koutou katoa. A ko Rogers me mui au, oku whānau tūturu. Engare, he te mati whāngai a hau. E te puake a ahau, he Jones no utaitahi e raro o te kurawa e o ngai tahu. Kia ora whānau. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and I first mahi to, to hear me for, um, for providing the, the waka for us to speak in. Uh, ngā mahi. Um, and I'm delighted to be um, speaking today. Um, I'm mahi to the reference group that Debbie is, is part of. I'm a Hita Paula for making the, the brave step in the Human Rights Commission to um, make this, these two reports a reality. I'm proud to be Māori. I'm proud to be disabled. But I know that both of those things, um, not because of the whakapapa or the disability, but the response to those uh, cause us harm, cause us discrimination, and cause us marginalisation. So in that context, I speak. Um, 
these two reports create a huge basis for change. And I and I'm here for that change to be really quick. I acknowledge Paula saying it's far too late, far too little. So um, I'm here for, for bringing about this, these reports so that change can happen. Um, to my knowledge, the the report of Whakamana here, Titiriti Whakahau Maru Ki Tangata, is the is the is the one of the first reports I know that talks about the intersectionality of disability and being Māori and having the mana of both. It is one of the first reports I know that talks about using the treaty, Titiriti Waitangi, as the um as the starting block, as the foundation as the evaluation tool almost as we move forward to create change. Um, this report talks about the need for tangata whaikaha Māori and whānau whaikaha Māori to be centre of um, leading the change and for us to be part of the implementation of the changes that need to happen. That is so, so essential. I absolutely um, endorse the, uh, the universal report that talks about um, making uh, making all services and supports accessible and for um, creating specialist services for disabled people. Um, I think it is uh, the, the, the fact that we have two reports is, is absolutely uh, crucial to create change for all of us. And in this place, I'm really proud to be here and to represent the, uh, the kaupapa just at this time, Wutango Tafano Whaikaha Māori. Um, we have had generational trauma and discrimination and all the things that have held us back. And it is now time to seek change and be in charge of, of ourselves and what we, what we want to achieve. Um, to do so, we need to build capacity, though. I just want to add that before I finish. We need to build capacity and we need the resource so that we can do that, so that we can make informed choices and make decisions that are good for us. So... So I ask Iwi, I ask Kapu, and I ask all of us to um, join together to ensure that the, that this report and the recommendations are realised. Kia ora tata. Kia ora. Thank you, Ruth. I now welcome Dr Debbie Hager, who, as we have heard, has researched and written extensively on the experiences of disabled people. Debbie is the lead author of the report Acting Now for a Violence and Abuse Free Future. Debbie will speak to the harm experienced by disabled people and the impact of that harm, and she will also speak to the need for systemic change. Thank you, Hemi. Kia ora koutou katoa. Um, ko Debbie Haga toko ingoa. Tangata whaikaha, deaf and disabled women, men and children are hurt in many ways by very many different people. Those they are close to, their family, people in public areas, in health, in education, social services, and by other professionals, landlords and their employers. The list of harm will be distressing. Disabled people may be purposefully frightened using a whole range of intimidating and confusing tactics, physically and sexually hurt and abused, verbally abused, emotionally bullied and harmed, neglected, exploited, over or under medicated, denied impairment specific help such as access to mobility or communication aids. Their support animals may be injured or killed People may be financially controlled and abused, or they may suffer unconsented seclusion and restraint. Disabled people may have their lives and actions controlled by people who seek power over them and may be denied personal autonomy and choice in their lives. Violence against disabled people happens everywhere, in the street, as happened last week, at school, in other organizational settings, in people's homes. There is also systemic, institutional and political discrimination, exclusion, neglect, silencing, marginalization and abuse. All of this harm to people has huge physical and emotional consequences. It can exacerbate existing impairments, create further sexual and physical damage and illness, 
and it causes acute and long lasting mental distress. There are very few services with the understanding, accessibility and expertise to respond to this harm. Having no one safe to disclose to and nowhere safe to go to escape abuse causes further distress and hopelessness and can lead to self-harm and suicide attempts. People are predated upon and harmed when they are perceived as powerless and without support or cultural value. This means that preventing and responding to this abuse requires not only a twin track service response from the mainstream sexual and domestic violence services, from police, from justice, and others involved in preventing and responding to violence, but disability specific services and responses. And even more importantly, much wider action to make disabled people visible in all areas of society without discrimination to ensure that all disabled people have equitable access to the determinants, determinants of health, which are a good income, education, good quality accessible housing, access to the social and natural worlds, freedom of choice and autonomy. We also need to make society fully accessible and to address societal ableism, stigma, misunderstanding and marginalization of disabled people. Stopping violence against tangata whaikaha, deaf and disabled people demands changes from all of us in the ways that we think about and understand disability and significant changes to the systems that have, up until now, enabled this harm to occur without consequences for those who perpetrate violence. I hope that the information in these reports and the many recommendations that we have made for systemic change will begin the process towards equitable responses and a violence-free Aotearoa. Thank you. Over to you, Paul. These reports bring together the extensive evidence and available information on the rates, risks, and unique manifestations of violence and abuse experienced by disabled people and tangata by kaha Māori. I would like at this point to present an overview of key recommendations from the reports to tackle this pressing problem of violence and abuse. To begin with, the implementation of all of the recommendations in the reports must be grounded in a te tiriti and human rights approach. Such approaches will only be effective when disabled people and tangata whaikaha Māori lead the work to address violence and abuse and also lead the solutions. There are two sets of recommendations in Whakamahia A Te Tu Kinokore in Nāianei A Mure Akene, acting now for a violence and abuse free future. The two sets of The recommendations firstly relate to rapidly improving service responses to violence and abuse and secondly recommendations addressing structural drivers of violence and abuse or health prevention. Firstly I want to talk about the recommendations to rapidly improve service responses to violence and abuse. They include firstly that our already proven hard safe and prevention for the resourcing of the national safeguarding adult from abuse risk. I acknowledge the government's recent injection of funding into this important basis. Secondly, we need to ensure that we provide resourcing for training and continuous improvement of the workforce across the disability, family, sexual violence and justice. A critical recommendation relates to supporting the twin track approach 
approach to violence response and prevention. Firstly, we must ensure that we build disability inclusive mainstream services that are accessible physically and have accessible information systems. We must build appropriate culturally based services, folk services to meet the needs of the same children safe through a whanau. I want to move now to recommendations addressing the structural drivers of violence and abuse that would help prevention. Firstly, to bring about transformative change to end the violence and abuse perpetrated against disabled people in Tangata Whaikaha Māori, we must not only respond to the disabled people who are harmed, but the structural issues in Aotearoa leading to increased risk of violence and abuse must also be tackled. When we think about the structural drivers of violence against disabled people, issues that come to mind are power inequities, lack of access to social and economic determinants of health, discrimination and stigma. The recommendations to address these drivers of violence and abuse include ensuring that all of the actions are grounded in te and human rights, address tangata whaikaha Māori and disabled people's lack of access to the determinants of health and well-being. We must strive to eliminate ableism and enhance access to justice. The key recommendations in the report honour the treaty, protect the person. Firstly, recognising the seriousness of the issues faced by tangata whaikaha Māori, another set of crucial recommendations are included in this report. It goes without saying that the violence perpetrated against tangata by kaha Māori can only be fully understood against the social backdrop of colonisation and dispossession, intergenerational trauma, racism, and the disconnection from Fano and whakapapa. Consequently, the recommendations in that report revolve around valuing Indigenous worldviews prioritising tino rangatiratanga and self-determination and moving from an individual focus on to whānau, hapu, iwi and communities. Before summing up, I now want to move on to introducing the Honourable Marama Davidson. Minister, I want to warmly welcome you to the launch of these reports. The Minister for the Prevention of Family and Sexual Violence. In that role, Minister, you have championed issues of violence and abuse. You have spoken publicly about the issues affecting disabled people. The joint venture on family and sexual violence has engaged warmly with the disability community, and I welcome and acknowledge that. And I also welcome and acknowledge, I know the advocacy that the Minister for Disability Issues, the Honourable Carmel Cipollone, has also contributed to the work of the joint venture. So I now hand over to you, Minister, to make some comments in response. Kia ora, tēnā koutou, e ngā maraikura, e ngā whatukura, e ngā tohunga o te tohe, tohe a te ao, tohe a te pua. Mei kore ake ko koutou, nō reira kia koutou, uh, ngā tua o tēnei kaupapa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. Nei, nei, kia ora, e mihi kauana, kia koutou, kia ora rā. Uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you so much, Hemi, my friend Hemi, for our um, whakato and start to this essential corridor. And thank you, Paula, for your introduction. And also for inviting me to respond on behalf of government to the release of these two important reports. And I love the name of them, so I want to say their names again. Whakamana hia te tiriti, whakahau maru tia te tangata, and whakamahia te tu kino, whakamahia te tu kino kore inaya nei, a muriake nei. 
I'd like to acknowledge you, Paula and the Human Rights Commission for commissioning these reports and particularly your work, Paula, to keep this issue not just on the government's agenda, but to make sure it is a priority for all of us. And I mean to you, um, you're on my screens, uh, Debbie, Ruth, and everyone who has been involved in pushing through these important reports. They highlight, for example, how a lack of data and evidence to date has also contributed to um, an action to address this issue. They also set out clearly the reality for many living with a disability and the violence they face. And we have heard that from the speakers already. We can see that each person harmed has their own experience of entrapment, of not knowing how to get support or where to seek help. A story about others disbelieving them, as I believe Paula already pointed out, or others not recognizing the signs to help. These reports make a substantial, essential contribution to the evidence base, but they are also a call to action. And I want to be clear that we have heard the voices of many disabled people impacted by violence, and we know enough to say out front that we should have always been acting on the shocking violence and abuse for our disabled whānau people and communities. But right now, we can commit to doing better. We all have a role to change this. Together we can change the myths and social norms that allow violence to happen around us at all. So how are we going to act on this urgent issue? And I heard you, Ruth, we need to act fast. Next week, Tuesday morning, in fact, 8 a.m. at Te Papa, but streamed for the nation, for the whole country, I will be launching the new national strategy to eliminate family violence and sexual violence and an associated action plan. The strategy will bring together a focus, stronger focus than ever before to prevention, healing, the role of tangata whenua and community leadership for achieving intergenerational change. The strategy has drawn on the knowledge and expertise of many, of the thousands of people who engaged with us, of the specialists and advocates working tirelessly in our communities to support people to get safe and be safe, of tangata whenua who have said many times that these complex issues require te ao Māori approaches and Indigenous leadership, of those in ethnic communities and Pacific peoples, children and young people, LGBTQIA plus communities, older people, and everyone who has struggled to access support when faced with violence, and yes, notably and essentially, disabled people and disabled communities. The strategy has been informed by engagement with disabled people and they raise many of the issues that are absolutely reinforced in these reports. I have been privileged to have also met with mem members of the disability community to directly hear their whakaro. Disabled people have highlighted to me the lack of specialist family violence and sexual violence services and supports the lack of a nationally consistent and mandated safeguarding approach and the need for more data and research to make visible their experiences and their expertise. They have emphasized to me that disabled people need to be at the decision-making tables. We also need to address the intergenerational impacts of colonization and racism in order for us to eliminate violence and I was so pleased to see these reports from the Human Rights Commission to uphold exactly that. Because we know that violence that impacts Fano is rooted in the marginalization of tangata whenua and societal changes enforced during the colonization of Aotearoa and continued to be experienced today. That multiple losses through colonization has included the disconnection from ancestral lands, the erosion of te reo, 
and the fragmentation of Māori social structures, including the inherent balance and complementarity of tāne and wahine and all genders, and the ingrained responsibility to care and protect those in our whānau who are vulnerable. Preventing family violence and sexual violence requires an understanding that family violence and sexual violence are transgressions of mana and whakapapa. There are solutions within the promotion and strengthening of whānau order that require a focus on healing, restoration, redress, and return to a state of noa, being without limitations. Our communities understand their own challenges and the diversity within them, and know that we will develop much better prevention approaches and responses when they are able to work closely with government. The solutions are in communities and government must work with you to enable solutions rather than obstruct or frustrate innovation. And I also just want to acknowledge once again that the speakers here this morning, the reports that have been commissioned also make it very clear that we created a disabling world and that we absolutely must transform to a world that is inclusive and accessible for all. Last week, I announced funding to grow and strengthen the safeguarding, safeguarding framework and safeguarding adults from abuse response in Waitamata, the location of the original SAFA pilot. This is part of the Violence Prevention Needs of Diverse Communities Fund. The safeguarding approach is consistent with Te Ao Māori concepts, values and practice. Safeguarding is about ensuring that disabled people have the support they need to make decisions and to live the lives they choose. It takes a holistic approach which focuses on improving the well-being of Fano as a collective without losing sight of individual needs. The safeguarding approach recognizes the important role of family and Fano in enabling their family members' aspirations and promotes positive relationships between the disabled person and Fano. This initiative will provide insights for the wider rollout of the safeguarding framework. And I would like to acknowledge Sue Hobbs and many others for their tireless work getting us to this point. Whilst I can't preempt next week's launch of the national strategy, I can tell you that the voices of disabled people have been heard and there will be a comprehensive set of actions which drive our initial steps over the next two years and which seek to pick up on the very uh, recommendations and challenges that you have outlined in these reports. Actions that will support strengthening, healing and responding to disabled people and tangata whaikaha. This will include actions to respond to calls from tangata whenua for resources and decision-making powers, as promised under Te Tiriti, to be the leaders in designing and implementing actions and change. So I look forward to being able to tell you more when the strategy is launched next week. Nō reira, uh, aku mihi mahana kia koutou, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. Tēnā koe e te minita. Uh, thank you so much, Minister Davidson. Uh, Mō taku he, um, I think I was a bit too excited and uh, uh, double introduced you. Um, tēnā koe, te tēnā koe, tēnā koutou katoa. We really appreciate your, you taking the time to be with us this morning. Uh, we can now take questions, and I see there have been several submitted during the launch. Um, and the first question uh, I'm going to pose to you, Paula. Uh, do you think there is an appetite for change? Kia ora, Hemi. Yes, I do think there's an appetite for change. I think one of the critical things that we hope to achieve through releasing these reports is to bring greater awareness to the issues. And 
as I mentioned earlier, that you know, for too long, issues around violence and abuse against disabled people have been you know, really hiding in plain sight. So I think the first step around creating that change is actually growing the awareness. And I think through these reports, we have, have done that. And through the work that uh, the engagement that we brokered with the joint venture and the work that they have done to understand the issues and the needs of disabled people in Tangata Paikaha Māori really builds on that. And you've just heard the Minister talk about the release of the government strategy next week. And I think the two reports we launched today give us a framing with which to assess the recommendations uh, coming out of those strategic plans. So I think, yes, there is appetite for change and the critical thing now is what we all do with these reports and I'll talk about that later. I might throw to you Debbie. Sorry just unmuting. Thank you Paula. I also believe that there is a readiness for change. Disabled people have been advocating for change for a very long time. The first report that I read was from 1987, where disabled women talked to the Ministry of Women's Affairs about the need to address violence. And I think now that many of the violence services and related services understand that disabled people are abused and want to respond, but haven't until now had any direction in how to do that and any um, governmental support to do it. So I think the release of these reports and then the release of the strategy is going to make a significant difference to, the, to that so that we have, we finally have a mandate for services to be inclusive. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, kia ora kōrua. Um, we have another Partai, another question. Um, who do you want to take the lead to provide resources for Tangata Whaikaha Māori? I might, I might start with Ruth. I knew you were going to do that, Kilda. <laughs> um, can you just repeat that first part of the question so that I'm really clear? Aroha mai. Akapai. So, who do you want to take a lead to provide resources for Tangata Whaikaha Māori? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, look, I think that this can be done in partnership because I see resources as putia. I also see resources as knowledge and, um, and experience. So I would, I would welcome the government uh, working on providing those resources so that we can share our mātauranga, our knowledge and our experience. Um, yeah, I think that that we need to we need to to walk together in this. I also go back to my initial statement when I um, Debbie is absolutely right in saying that disabled people have been advocating for change for a long, 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 long time. There are there are also disabled people in our community who um, need to be resourced so that we know what's not okay and what's okay, and how to make good decisions and and the stuff that builds our capacity to be to be citizens alongside everybody else. So I think that there's also that piece that needs to happen, which is under enabling good lives, but still as important. So for me, there's a balance. So there's resourcing absolutely that's needed by government so that we can share our, our knowledge and experience and our wealth of, of all who we are, as well as providing the capacity so that disabled people have uh, their own um, capability and capacity to have a voice, really, um, and uh, and know what's okay. Yeah, Kilda. Oh, Kilda, Ruth. Uh, so, just want to encourage people on the call to um, to use the different methods of getting some code all through, or if if you want, you can put that put that your questions through on the chat. Uh, and the team will, will moderate that. I'm going to come back to you, Paula, and um, ask everyone on the panel perhaps their ideas. But starting with you, Paula, what, what do you think are the next steps for the Commission? 
Thanks, Hemi. So I'm really clear that releasing these reports today is an important part of the process, but it doesn't start here and it most certainly does not end here. The critical next steps from our perspective are to review the national strategy that the government will be releasing next week through the lens of these two reports. We need to make sure that we're using the reports to work with government agencies service providers and a range of NGOs and other organisations to actually help support make the recommendations in the reports real, you know, really bring them to life. And that's going to take sustained work with a number of agencies. What the reports do is offer a roadmap of recommendations. And I don't want to see these reports just you know, sit on <laughs> in drawers and tables and, and you know, people not respond. So I certainly will be working with agencies to make sure they pick up these reports and that they respond. There'll also be a lot more public awareness raising and talking about these really important issues and enabling disabled people in Tangata Whaikaha Māori to lead those conversations and use these reports to have those really important conversations around Aotearoa. So today marks a really important initial step in getting this information out, but we have a long way to go to make sure that the recommendations are picked up and implemented and implemented by disabled people and Tangata Whaikaha Māori with support from key decision makers. Thanks, Hemi. Kia ora, Paula. Uh, we have another question. Um, how does understanding the past help create solutions for the future? And I guess we'll ask this question of every, everyone on the panel and we might start with you, Minister Davidson. Kia ora, Hemi. Um, that is such an essential, crucial question because the enduring solutions, the solutions that recognize the context of how the past has impacted on what people are experiencing today, um, it is through the lens of looking at the past, looking at what has happened, that we can properly see the barriers, the systemic um, racism, the systemic barriers to disabled people and whānau, it is only through doing that that we can truthfully and authentically um, come up with the enduring solutions that both remove those systemic barriers, those systemic discriminations, and also rebuild the solutions that are needed. One of the, um, one of the parts of the strategy that I released next Tuesday that makes me really proud and that these two reports strengthen is that it is very clear that the solutions absolutely lie with the very communities who are at the forefront of facing the harm. That the people, as Ruth has pointed out, the resources of both people, knowledge and putia um, needs to be devolved back to community, needs to be authorised and the power needs to devolve back to community. But as Ruth has pointed out, not without neglect from working with government agencies. So that's where the partnership to make sure that communities have the capacity and capability is crucial. This is not about government stepping away. It is about government maintaining its responsibility and working with community. So bringing in the past, what the context was, what the discriminations have been and the barriers have been is the only way to understand what the enduring long-term solutions will be for communities as well. Thank you, Minister. Um, any other members of the panel have some comments or kōrero to share? Kia ora, Debbie. You're on mute. Sorry. One of the really important things we have to learn from the past is how the way disabled people have been treated has harmed them, but also meant 
that many people in society really have only a very stereotypical and understanding of who a disabled person is. And over and over again, I see that people don't recognize that they have a disabled person in their family and as part of their friendship group because they're thinking of a certain kind of person that might not be the disabled person. And, and what that has done is it has made disability invisible. Um, disabled people are 24% of the population. There's a whole lot of us who are, who are here in front of you as who are part of the community and are invisible. And there's a whole lot of other people who have been made invisible because they've been in institutional and residential care and not enabled to be part of the community. And so what that does is allow harm to occur and allow harm to be ignored. And so I think that's a crucial message that we learn from the past to ensure that we never let those things happen again. Thank you to, to you, Ruth. Oh, kia ora, Debbie, I absolutely agree. And I, I just want to remind ourselves and all of ourselves that there are also Māori values that are my, from my rano, that are about manaki and tiaki and aroha and tautoko and those and ranga tiratanga. And those are the values that we can use to move forward. So what a beautiful whakatauki it is to, as we walk forward, we look back and let's realise that whakatauki, let's think about our tipuna who were disabled and who had valued roles and um, and could do all the things. That's my saying of the moment, but could do all the things because of the the values that we wrap around each other. We think of hapanu, hapu iwi, and those collective structures that have supported us. So I think if, if I say anything to finish off, for me, it's about um, bringing those structures to the fore again for disabled Māori and to use those principles also for everybody because we know they work. Kia ora tata. Uh, kia ora Ruth and, and Debbie. Paula, would you have anything to add? I'll just restate the question. How does understanding the past help create solutions for the future? Uh, kia ora Hime. Uh, just acknowledge the comments made by the Minister Ruth and Debbie. I think probably just, you know, really underscore those comments and perhaps just add, you know, my own reflection is that, you know, we've, we've arrived at today by trying to have a much better understanding of the power inequities that exist and that particularly exist for disabled people and tangata whaikaha Māori and the lack of access to all the supports in life that enable a person to maintain their well-being and you know we we understand that much more now than perhaps we did in the past and I think a growing understanding of discrimination and stigma and you know if we don't understand those things that have got us to today it, it makes it hard to move to tomorrow so I think you know we're at a much better place in understanding some of those things and, and we we certainly know we understand that the past influences the way that we think about the future so and, and just total growth you know your, your comments about um, the Tao Māori values that can be offered here to guide us into the future and one of the things that you know we've really tried to demonstrate in these reports is that understanding violence perpetrated against Tangata Whaikaha Māori you know, is against that backdrop in history of colonisation and intergenerational trauma and disconnection from whānau and whakapapa and those are crucial to understand so I, I think it's a really great question and should absolutely guide us on the way forward. So, namahi. Uh, tēnā pē, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, you raised some good points, particularly around some of the challenges that we might face. I guess a question to to the entire panel: Are there are there examples of good practice that we could build on? Um, might come to you first, Ruth, if that's okay. Thank you, Hemi. Um, look, the good practice for me, um, and I'm hoping I'm doing this within the context of human rights, is whānau order. Um, I'm lucky enough to be under Putahitanga in the South Island, Te Paunamu, 
and whana order principles um, are like the principles that we talked about. So I think that if we uh, if we bear that in mind, if we think about the organize for me, the Māori organisations and the Māori whānau who bring our voices to the front, uh, that may not be to do with stopping violence. So Stevie can talk about that much more clearly than I can. But a final order allows our voice to come through. And certainly Te Putahitanga uh, does that for us. So I think that, that you know, I think that for me, if that's the start, we need to, final order allows us to focus on the good stuff. Um, and I know there's lots of not good stuff, but I think that um, it reframes our thinking. And I think that we need that. Tangata whānau whaikaha need that to, in order to be strong and to be to show our competence and our confidence to the world. Kilda, Debbie, I, I know that you can add to that beautifully. Thank you, Ruth. I was thinking that really the critical learning in terms of violence prevention is to ensure that we have finally sufficient resources to make services inclusive. This is, this is what hasn't occurred in the past. While sexual and domestic violence services have wanted to work with disabled people, they haven't been resourced to do that. And so it's very exciting that we now have a national strategy which acknowledges the need to resource services and to upskill services to be able to work with everybody. So I think that that's a significant change. And I would hope that everyone who's listening will work with us to advocate for that in an ongoing way so that, so that the change that is beginning now will keep rolling and that we'll no longer have to talk about them and us, but it will be inclusive services for everyone. And then also recognizing that there's are specialist services that we need for people who have particular needs and that we need services for women and for others who have been really harmed by violence and therefore need long-term supportive care over and above that which Refuge is able to offer at the moment, that people with drug and alcohol problems need specific care, that there are disabled men and boys who need specific services. So, I think that there's a really strong will to be inclusive. We just now need to keep advocating for that to occur. Thank you. I wonder if I might actually invite listeners to think about what you can do with these two reports. And, you know, as I said before, getting these reports out there is the first step, but my hope is that disabled people in Tangata Whaikaha Māori use these resources to grow awareness, to advocate for funding, to advocate for change. My hope is that service providers read the recommendations and think about how your services can be more responsive to disabled people in Tangata Whaikaha Māori. And I hope that government agencies use the reports to really help guide your work and the government's direction in this area. I think we're at such a crucial time with the release of these reports really shining the light on the seriousness of these issues for disabled people, coupled with the release of the government strategy next week. I hope that both contribute to a much safer and violence-free Aotearoa. But the success of these reports will be in how people use them, how people speak to them, and how people involve disabled people and tangata whaikaha Māori in implementing the recommendations. So I really urge people to pick these reports up and, and really use them. Thanks, Hemi.